Hello, everyone. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> nice to see everyone here. I was uh, a little nervous when I saw that they booked me for first thing on a Sunday morning after everyone's been drinking last night. So it's good to see you. And anyone who comes in here late, we shall look upon them with shame. My name is Marco Bucci, and uh, I was here two years ago. It's great to be back at the GIC. Thank you for having me. Uh, if anyone was at my talk two years ago, you probably remember this. My daughter was just born weeks before my last talk two years ago, and there we are FaceTiming from my hotel room. Today, that little girl is learning how to use the toilet, and uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of her. Anyway, I just wanted to Uh, I guess a professional artist since 2004, 2005 roughly, and exclusively I've worked in the domain of color, be it uh, character design or concept or you know, environments or backgrounds or matte paintings, uh, really color has been the reason I've always been hired and the focus of my work, uh, and that's what I want to talk about with you for the next hour. Now, when we talk about color, we all need to have the same context because color, it's easy, but it's hard at the same time. And what makes it hard is, is people don't know how to talk about it. So I wanna get on the same page with you guys here and uh, figure out the terminology we want to use. Some of this will be very repetitive, so I'll go through this part quick. There is our friend, the color wheel. If this is not your friend now, it will be after this hour is over, I promise. Uh, the first thing we want to know about the color wheel is uh, this outside ring are oh well, all the colors we can see, uh, yellow, orange, red, blue, purple. These are called, uh, oops, sorry, these are called hues, the color names, okay, hue. Next up is saturation. The outside of the, the color wheel here is uh, perfectly saturated. You can see my mouse, right? Yeah, is, is pure saturation. Uh, the amount of chroma in a given color is saturation. So the most chroma is the most saturated. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you can see the, the color swatch has moved right here. We have, gray or less saturated. Now, I have the, I use, I use Photoshop. Uh, we have the Photoshop color picker up here. And when I say gray, because you will hear me say the term gray a lot in this hour, because according to me, gray is the secret of understanding color. When I say gray, you don't necessarily have to be perfectly gray. You know, like this in the middle of the color wheel here is perfectly gray, no, no chroma. All the colors join in the gray. But when I say gray, I don't necessarily mean perfectly gray. See where my mouse is around here? To me, this is also gray. It's a degree. A gray works in degrees, just like saturation works in degrees. You know, as I move my mouse here, I'm getting more saturated. As I move my mouse here, I'm getting less saturated or more gray. Um, the next thing is uh, value. Although before I get there, I just want to talk about one thing quickly. When we talk about color, this is something I'm sure we've all learned very early in our uh, art lives. I learned this when I was in third grade. Uh, warm versus cool. Warm colors, cool colors. This is the main color theory that nature uses, and a big part of my talk is understanding how nature uses color and then understanding how we can use it. We want to think about warm and cool. Well, the easiest way to think about warm and cool, and we're going to dig further into this within this talk, the warm colors, as I learned when I was a little kid, are around, the, are around this area, the yellows, the oranges, the reds. In this area, these are the stereotypical warm colors. And then on the opposite end of the color wheel, we have the stereotypical cool colors, the cold colors, blue, maybe some greens, you know, into the purples. This range here is cool. And they occupy two different sides of the color wheel. That's the most general way to describe warm and cool. Keep that in mind as we move forward. These two colors that you see on screen right here, those are the same hue, but different values. So they're different colors, right? Value affects color too. But on the color wheel, those two colors are the same on the color wheel. So temperature wise, uh, well, I haven't said temperature yet. In terms of their warm and cool, they're basically the same, even though the value has changed. This is one of the difficulties about talking about color because you also have to factor in value. I could talk, I have, classes that are eight weeks long where I talk about values and colors. Obviously, I'm here for an hour today, so we're just going to try and focus on color. I'll, I'll mention value here and there, but 
uh, keep in mind that the color wheel does not show us value, okay? It's a bit of a, a hurdle we all have to deal with. The big problem with talking about color is the, uh, the hue names. Like, you know, what color is that? It's red, right? Red, great, we, we all got it right. That doesn't mean anything because, well, what color is that? Uh, sorry, on the screen it's a subtle difference. On my monitor it's a little bit clearer, but they're subtly different, right? Well, if you also say red, we got a problem now because it's the, it's the same word for two different colors. So it's, the hue names are not good enough. Those two reds appear at two different spots in the color wheel. I would say that this red is warmer than that red. Why? Well, because remember how I said that these are basically the cold colors? This red is on the warmer side, and then we move this way, and we have this red. They're two different reds. One is a warmer red, and one is a cooler red. So those words right there, warmer and cooler, we always have to qualify a color with that. And you notice I'm not saying warm red and cool red. I'm saying warmer red and cooler. That implies movement the movement of one color to another. That movement is what we need in our paintings to create color harmony. Uh, you know, so, you know, the hue names here, basically useless. They're useful for my two-year-old daughter when she's coloring with her markers and she says, Daddy, can I have purple? Great, that's useful. But for us as artists, this is not useful enough. We need, uh, you know, here we go, color names not very useful because they do not tell us the temperature of the color. Temperature, warmer, cooler. We need to know the temperature. So uh, we have here the hues, and you know you can see cooler temperature here, warmer temperature. This is what I'm talking about. This is how we need to think about color. You know, let's just say red, for example. As red gets cooler, well, we can see the, mini, the little mini color wheel there. As red gets cooler, it goes this way, and it slides into purples. So we have red as it transitions away from red into purple. This is, to me, is red getting cooler. And then, of course, red getting warmer, and you know, it transitions the other way up into the yellows, of course, the oranges and yellows. And the same with all the other colors. It's a very simple concept. You're just moving around the color wheel. Um, this gives us context. Our, our brain is so used to seeing colors move in nature. This is how nature works. Nature doesn't give us flat colors. Nature is always moving, warm to cool, uh, in subtle ways and in big ways. And our, our brains, just from living, even if you're not an artist, you're so used to seeing this, this is the movement we have to replicate in our paintings. So color harmony, to me, is the visual traceable link between colors, or to use my favorite word, movement. It's the way the color moves. In your paintings, you need your colors to move in such a way that your brain recognizes the way it's moving, and, and I'm gonna get into exactly how that movement works in just a second. So check my time here. Okay, so, moving color. The simplest way to move color is just from one color to another color, two colors. This is an old painting I did um, 15 years ago when I was first getting acquainted with, uh, maybe even more than that, when I was first getting acquainted with this idea of color temperature. I was doing a lot of these practices where I would have a, a big slice of light cutting the image basically in half. This is not the best composition in the world. I, was, I did this to practice color. Um, this is what's called a complementary palette. Complementary just means two colors, one, two. They're opposite ends of the color wheel. Uh, as you can see here, I just took some samples of uh, colors from the painting and plotted them on the color wheel, and this is where they are. Just so everyone's clear, obviously, in the middle of the color wheel is gray, like I've already described, right? So, you know, this color here is a purplish gray. This color here is like a medium saturated yellowish color or maybe a medium gray yellow, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, but it's two colors. You've got basically two colors. You have your yellows and you have your purples, complements, and the colors move. Now, one thing I want to point out here, you notice that the colors are not moving this way or this way. They're moving this way. It's almost like, imagine a bridge between these two colors that crosses over the land of the gray. Gray is the secret of color. Uh, this is how colors move, through gray. Now, um, let me just go here. If you are not a painter, or maybe you are not, maybe you're afraid of color, which I certainly was when I started, 
be not afraid, there is a very easy way to practice complementary colors without even having to paint anything or without having to draw anything. Uh, just do this. Plot your most saturated warm color here, your most saturated cold color here. In this case, I'm using the same complementary palette, yellow versus purple. Put your perfect gray in the middle, as you can see I've, in my Photoshop color picker there, and just start filling in the difference, the, the distance between them with various degrees of saturation and gray. Just start filling it in. Everyone can do this. Uh, you don't need to be an artist to do this. In fact, this exercise will inform your color choices later. And what's interesting about color is, remember how I said that color names are useless? Well, and how gray is the secret of color? You don't necessarily need a very saturated color and a very saturated color on the other side for your paintings to look colorful. You see the, the circle that I've drawn in the middle there? You could just as easily have your painting be from this warm to this cool and, your pa and, and you know, bridge the gap in the middle to have that movement between the two. And your painting will still look perfectly colorful. You don't need the full range. Uh, and I'll, we're gonna dive into that further as we go. I just wanna show you a video. I've, I recorded myself painting, uh, painting a, a sort of a study based on my own painting. I just wanna push play. This is sped up, so I'll talk over it. The first thing I'm gonna do is, uh, sorry, I'm just setting up my layers here. I'm just painting on one layer and I have my line drawing on top. You notice that, let me just push pause here, whoops. I start with gray. As you can see, my color picker there, that's where I'm starting. This is nice because if you start with gray, you can build out, I'm using two hands here, one going to warm, one going to cool. And you can manage how far. So they say this is the warmest and this is the coldest. I've already, I just explained, you don't have to be at these extremes, you can be here, right? It's a problem if you're just here. That's not good color. You need some movement. But as you start gray, when you start gray, you can start building out. And maybe, maybe I want the yellows to continue further, or, or the, the warms, or maybe I want the colds to continue further. I can play with whatever range I want. That's up to you as an artist. Let me just push play again here. So I'm gonna start doing that. I'm gonna start adding color. Now, uh, okay, I'm showing you that you can start saturated, but I'm gonna start gray. The light's coming in this way. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't use my hand. From the top right. You notice those yellows are very gray. You see where I'm at in the color picker? And the purples are also very gray. I'm building as I go. I start with the foundation of gray, the secret, and I build out. Now, let me just push pause. I'm also using value because I'm doing a painting here. You know, it would take me a whole other series of lectures to also talk about value. But remember, you know, you can see that I've got a dark purplish color pick, pick there in my cold colors. That's still a cold color. So let me just keep going. If anyone has questions about value, we can talk about it after the, the lecture. So I'm just building up some color. Here's some more. Here is some more. I'm just turning down the line layer. Let's see what's going on here. Look at where I'm at saturation-wise on the color picker, adding saturation, adding that movement. The more saturation you add from gray, the more movement you are giving the viewer. And the viewer is able to trace this with their brain. They can trace this movement. This creates color harmony, as I've already said. Just building that color. I'm pretty reserved still, pretty much still in the gray. But the painting is starting to come to life a little bit, color-wise. This video's in two parts. This, this part's almost done. Let's, uh, let's skip to the next part here. Oh, some more saturated yellows coming in. Let's skip to the next part, here we go. This is how I paint. Uh, this is an old painting, you know, but the most complex subject matter, I'll tackle it the same way. Uh, there are exceptions that I'll talk about a bit later. There are different ways you can tackle it, but I like starting from gray. Here, I'm adding, see what I'm doing here? Uh, in this area here and here. Yeah, you can see it on the screen, I think. Um, adding little bits of saturation over the grays. So the idea is not, you, you can see that I've blocked in this light, right? These light yellows, that's the sunlight hitting the scene. I'm not just starting gray and then covering those grays with saturation. Excuse me. You add saturation in little bits, little, it's almost like sprinkling salt or something on your meal. That's how I think about saturation. Things, little shapes here and there of saturation. 
Uh, and I'll do the same with both the warms and the cools. So let's continue building this painting. You can do this in so many ways if you're working digitally. You can have a brush set to uh, overlay mode and overlay, you know, spray in some saturation, like glaze it in. Oil painters use glazing too, acrylic painters. You can use multiply mode and you know, uh, go darker and more saturated, whatever you want. Here I'm, see, I have a very saturated color now and watch what I'm gonna do. I think I do it here with an airbrush. It's coming up, adding saturation, adding saturation. Flipping the painting helps you judge how it's looking. You notice I've added more saturation in the yellows than the purples, the yellows being the warm color. Here's some more saturation though in the purples here on the roof. And I'm just about to start, I think I start glazing in some warm colors at this point. Yeah, so let me just pause here. This little diagram shows how I'm organizing my color. Remember how I just did my, with my hands, I kind of did this to go to warm to cool. Well, in this painting, what I decided to do, and there's no right or wrong here, it's just personal choice as an artist. In this case, I pretty much have both very saturated warms and very saturated colds. But in terms of how, how much of the gray I'm using, I've decided to use more grays. If you look at here, I've decided to use more grays in the colds and fewer grays in the warms. My warms are kept mostly, mostly saturated, not fully saturated, but the, the range is narrower in the warms and the range is greater in the colds. That's something you can do. You don't, it doesn't have to be equal, but as long as you have that movement, you know, we can, the brain will fill, your brain will fill this movement in. It understands the movement. And that's what's important. How you delineate it, uh, the, you know, the exact colors you choose don't matter. That's one of the questions I get a lot from students. And this is why I'm so interested in reframing this conversation about color. Uh, push pause for a second. Students always ask me, because uh, I've, I've taught art for more than 10 years now, students always ask me, you know, how do I know what color to pick? And I always say, that's actually not the question you should be asking yourself. It's a good question, but that's not the question you should be answering. It always is not what color. It's where is your color in the context of your color movement. So if I know I'm gonna go warm, it's not which exact color am I picking, it's what range am I in? Am I in very warm, saturated here, or am I in the grays here? The range is, is the answer that you're looking for, not the exact color. You need to know what your range is, the context of the movement you're working within. That's what you need to answer. And then from there, it's actually quite freeing. Color is actually quite easy because any color can be correct. Um, I thought there was a point in this video where I glaze color in with an airbrush, but I guess there isn't. But sometimes I will, as you can see in the final, the final's a bit more saturated. Probably what I did in the final, that's my original painting here, I probably took an airbrush on overlay mode and just blasted in some overall uh, warm temperature there just to, just to push those warms a little bit. Uh, oftentimes, uh, often uh, a technique I use is where the light is, I'll push the color the most there. I don't always do that, but it is a good way to help pop the color. If you, know, you take where the sunlight is, in this case, you know, hitting the trees here, and push the colors more there. Uh, it'll, whether the colors are warm or cool. There's this uh, myth that, uh, I, again, I was taught this in many, many years ago in art school that actually is a lie. People say warm colors pop forward, cool colors recede. That's not true. It's light that pops forward or recedes. Color can be a chameleon. Warm colors can come forward, cool colors can come forward. That doesn't matter, that, that's up to you. It's more about value as to what comes forward. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's move ahead here. Okay, yeah, I've already shown you the range of colors. And uh, you know, there's the, that's my original final painting, just, just two colors. But what's amazing though, is just using two colors, a warm and a cool across from each other on the color wheel. Uh, sorry, I just wanna see my timer here. I have a timer going just because I always lose track of time when I do these talks. There we go. Um, it looks like there's more than two colors. Well, because there are, you have a warm and a cool and you have all this range in between. Those are all different colors. So there's a lot of color in this painting, even though I'm only using two hues. It's the grays or the saturation that really helps inform your palette. Okay, nature's color. This is a big thing we have to understand and I'm gonna give you my favorite principle for how nature works. Uh, this is a photograph that my mom took. It's not a good photo. It, this, is, this photograph is not going to win any awards. I was traveling, this is from 2002. I was traveling with my mom. This is in Italy. That's, that's my hand right there. Uh, we were looking at this beautiful bridge. 
But what I, what I like about this photo from an artistic standpoint in terms of studying color, I really like that there's this big shadow cutting across the picture. This is very much like the painting I just did with the light cutting across. In fact, it was this photo that my mom took that kind of clued me in, like, hey, this is actually a very good way of studying color. Just have a big shadow cut across the middle. It's not a good composition, but it is good for studying color because now we have a very good comparison between what nature does in the light and what nature does in the shadow. So I want to show you an exercise that I used to do every morning uh, when I was first learning about color. I would load up a photo like this, and I would have a little chart at the bottom, light versus shadow, and I would just start sampling colors. You know, I would pick a color from that tree, from that bridge, from that rock, and from that bush, and you know, et cetera, everywhere in the light. Just make sure that the colors you're picking are in the sunlight, and just paint them here. Paint them connected. See how they're all uh, merging and blending and connected? Paint them like that, because it, 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 I'll show you in a second why. And then, of course, paint the shadows. Just sample everything, the rock, the car, the street, uh, whatever, the railing, the rock back there, the bridge. Put all your shadows in the shadow category. Everyone can do this. Now we have a little map that we can start evaluating. I've got a color wheel here. Here's one of my favorite things to observe about nature. The light really, really dictates color, the, uh, especially sunlight. In my classes, uh, I often refer to the light as a bully, like a schoolyard bully. You know, It wants to take everything it hits and make its color like the sun. So if the sun is hitting something and the sun is a bully, the sun wants to take whatever it hits and make it close to the sun. Now the sun has different colors throughout the day, but let's just say in general the sun is usually in the warm range. Obviously the warm changes from afternoon to evening to morning. We're not talking about that, but let's just generically ballpark the sun somewhere in the yellowish range because the sun always is somewhere in the warms. So uh, let's just say the sun is like a yellowish thing, right? Yellowish, not perfectly yellow, but whatever the sun hits, it will bully or push toward that yellow. So this is why we do these samplings. The green of the tree, that green is not located here. It's located near the yellow. It moves this way. The sun being somewhere in this range, somewhere in this range here, will bring that color this way. If the sun hits something red, uh, like a classic, you know, uh, I love being here in, in Europe because you have the, these beautiful red rooftops that we just don't have in Canada. I'm from Canada, by the way. <laughs> uh, we, you know, the sun takes these red rooftops and bullies them this way. A red rooftop will look more orangey in the sunlight. The sun will take a gray color of a rock. You know, what's, what color is a rock? Like somewhere here. It will pull it, it will just pull it to, toward the yellows. Um, it's almost like a, in wrestling when you pin your opponent. You, you don't let them move. That's what the sun does to its color. It will, it will hover around here. Every color in the scene that's in light, in sunlight, will be pinned around here. Now the shadow, totally different story in the shadow. The shadow, if, if the sun is a bully and the sun bullies what it hits in the light, well, the shadow is not hit by the sun. So the shadow is free to play. The shadow is free to wander. Most of the color you see happens in the shadow. Sorry, my voice just cracked there. Uh, because the shadow, like I just said, is, is free of the bully. So if you look at just the shadow colors that I've sampled here, hopefully you guys can all see that. Um, there are many different colors. Look, there's some blue, there's some orange, there's, some, uh, there's more greens in there. there. There are more hues in the shadow. In the sun, there are some hues, like I can see greens and oranges, but they are very close together because of the bully, where the shadow is much more open. I wanna show you how you can apply this. And uh, this is one of my favorite little studies to do because you don't have to be able to draw well. If you can draw well, that's great. Uh, but if, if some of you are, are shy about drawing, try this. Anyone can draw this. A sun and a tree, and make sure you make the sun smiling. Now, you wanna start putting in your local color. What's local color? Well, local color is the, the useless hue names, like, like uh, the sky is blue, so paint blue. Good. The tree, uh, the sun is yellow, sure, paint yellow. The tree is green and the trunk of the tree is brown. Okay, paint those colors. Again, everyone can do this. Now, what a child could do this. Now, what we want to do that a child cannot do is now start thinking about temperature. Well, maybe a child could do this too. Um, okay, so that color you see there, that is the color I just painted for the grass and the tree. What I want to do, oh, there we go. What I want to do is apply this bully theory. 
The sun is going to light the scene, obviously. You can see the arrows pointing the sun direction. I want to take that green, that local color green, and bully it down. So watch, watch the color change, okay? There to there. Simple as that. I want to take that color, bring it down toward the yellow. It, down because Photoshop, you know, <laughs> doesn't have a color wheel, it has a color strip. So I'm saying down toward the yellow. Uh, and I want to paint that. So this is the bully influence of the sun hitting that tree. Of course, the value gets lighter too because it's light, but I'm not talking about value today so much. So we have a warmer green in the light. Now instantly, if I go back, this green is useless because it's, it's, not, it's not moving, right? The number one mistake you can make with color is not moving it. It's okay to start that way. I've started with a block in, but this is not good for a final because it's not moving. Now it's moving. Now we have a warmer green and a colder green, but I, I can still make that shadow even colder because oftentimes with, with local color, a good technique is to start in the middle in terms of temperature, if you're starting green, start in the middle of your green, as you can see where I'm at there. That way you can go colder toward the blues and warmer toward the yellows. So sometimes I do like to start in the middle. Uh, now, I wanna take that same green, look at the color picker here, and for the shadow, I wanna go that way. See, it's very subtle, but it's moving. I wanna go that way, and I'll paint that in. Now I have a tree that actually looks, I mean, it's drawn badly on purpose, but it looks like it's hit by the light. I like this exercise because you don't, again, you don't have to draw well. Color is different than drawing. A lot of people, uh, just a quick side note, a lot of people will complain, you know, as, as a teacher, I hear this a lot from students. They'll say, uh, <clears throat> you know, I have color problems in my painting. And I look at their painting. It's, it's not a color problem, it's a, it's a drawing problem. Drawing is hard, color is easy. Uh, and you can, and this hopefully proves it because you don't have to draw well. And the movement is actually quite simple to do. Okay, so what I've done here is I've just applied Here's the, you know, the local color of the tree trunk. I'm just applying warm versus cool. Uh, hopefully you can, I'm not putting up a color wheel right now because hopefully you can just see this. Look at how the light of the tree trunk is more yellowy. It's, it's warmer, the sun has bullied it more yellow. It's not so different than the green. It's a bit different, but not much. If I go back to a color picker, the light of the tree trunk might be there and the light of the tree might be there. Just a small difference. Again, that sun will bully and pin these colors together. And then the shadow of the tree is more grayish purple is what I see. Uh, that's how I would describe it. It's colder though. It's colder by going purple. And just in a moment, I'll show you some color charts that show you different ways of moving from warm to cool, I promise. Uh, and then the shadow there is the same as this, just a cooler green, same as the shadow of the tree. And uh, you can see I'm playing with some different warm colors in the light of the grass. And then this, all this is, is reflected light. Now what's reflected light? Let me just go way back for a second to my exercise here. This. Reflected light is a very fun way of getting cooler colors in your, in your paintings. The sky is blue, as we all know. Well, the sky will shine its light downward, hitting things in the shadow uh, that, that face up. So things like the rock here. That rock is exposed to the sky. So the blue of the sky will hit that rock. The blue of the sky will hit the rock in light too, but it doesn't matter because the sun is so strong, the sun will bully the, well, tell the sky to get out of here. It will bully the sky away. The skylight doesn't matter in the light. The sun is what matters in the light. And when I say sun, you can also substitute that with a light bulb. A light bulb will bully the colors in a light. Uh, in shadow though, where colors are much more free, that blue sky becomes a major player in your cooler colors because the blue sky will hit everything that's exposed to it. It'll hit that road, it'll hit that wall, it'll hit my hand there, it'll hit, every, it'll hit these trees. So when I am going here, right there, all I've done is I've added that blue sky. I have taken my cool colors, we start gray, I've taken, the blue is a very good way to take your cold colors and keep pushing them, keep pushing them toward blue, keep pushing them toward cold. It's a very nice thing to do. Now, you notice that in this tree, I've only added them at the top of the tree. Why is that? Well, because the sky is only available to the top of the tree. The sky is not gonna hit there because light doesn't bend. It's not gonna go like that and hit the bottom of the tree. It's just gonna come down and hit the top of the tree. Just like it's gonna come down and hit the shadow here. It's probably not gonna hit the shadow there because the tree is blocking it. This is ambient occlusion. Uh, anyone in 3D will know ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is where the ambient light or the uh, reflected light from the sky is blocked, it's occluded. So we don't have the, uh, sunlight, uh, the skylight hitting there, it's, it's occluded. And also the skylight is occluded from hitting there. So we have ambient occlusion there too. But the sky will probably come down 
and hit that part of the tree. So I've put it there. Uh, again, in the spirit of bad drawing, I'm not trying to draw well here. But the color is now, we have a painting. Uh, it's a painting that is not going to win any awards because the drawing's not there. Drawing is what wins awards, not color. Uh, this is how you can practice. It's a great way. Now, here, here's a painting that might win an award. This is Scott Christensen, a world-renowned artist. I had the pleasure of, of studying with Scott back in 2008. I took a workshop with him for 10 days, and he, uh, he's one of the people that helped revolutionize my understanding of color. This painting is not different than this painting, except for the drawing. Color, the, the drawing is everything. Color-wise, though, let's look at this. And I have a color wheel here just in a second. It's, it's very similar in the sense that there's a big sort of shaft of light sort of cutting the scene. It's a little more sophisticated than what I was doing in my studies, but it's, it's very similar in terms, you can see the shadows kind of cutting through, right? Let's look at the tree in the light, just with our eyes. Like, look at the trees here. Look at those greens, and, and when I say greens, there's different types, right? There's like some subtly warmer greens, uh, subtly different green there, but these are all warm greens as compared to the greens in the shadow. If you look at these are very dark. I don't even know if you can see them on the screen, but they are colder. Let me bring up a color wheel here. This is better. You can see this is, this is probably good here. Look at this part of the green tree here. This is in the sunlight. I would put those greens on a color wheel probably about there, may, maybe there, somewhere in here. Again, it doesn't matter if you're exactly right. As long as you have the range, somewhere in here, because I know it's, the sun is bullying, bullying them up to the warms, I'd put them about there. Now move down the tree, and we can see like these almost magenta colors. You can see them on the screen, right? Almost magenta colors. I, where, where would you put that on the color wheel? I would put them somewhere about here, in this range. So we have our, in my mind, we have our warms here, and then our cools in the shadow are down here. We have different shadow colors too, though, like in this area here. Uh, sorry, the screen is a bit dark, but there's some blues. I don't know if you can see it, but there's some subtle blues in here. Again, skylight hitting it. I'd put those blues. Scott Christensen is keeping his, his cool colors very gray in this painting. Scott Christensen is actually the person who really taught me about grays because Scott Christensen doesn't really use a ton of color. That is, not a ton of saturated color. He always uses color movement because you need to for a good painting, but he doesn't use a lot of saturation. Uh, he's very restrained, but his warms are around here, and his cool colors are somewhere in the gray, purple grays, bluish grays. Um, as long as you are in the cooler range, it doesn't matter what colors you use. It doesn't matter that this color here is like a violet color. It can easily just be a, a bluish color. As long as it's cooler, it doesn't matter. Look at the grass here. This is a good example. Maybe I should have started here. This grass is in shadow, right? This grass is in light. We can clearly see that difference, right? This, where would you put this color on the color wheel? I don't know, somewhere, yeah, somewhere here, a grayish warm versus this color. I would put that color, I would take my grayish warm and I would move it around, about over here. Now, that's cooler. Why is that cooler? Well, because it's going away from the warm. It's moving this way. So, and this is another painting uh, by Scott Christensen where it's a totally different palette. Like this one's more blue overall, right? but it's the exact same model of color movement. So I'm gonna check my time here, okay. We have, uh, we can just see the snow. I think it's the best is to look at the snow. Here is snow in shadow. Can you see how much bluer it is than the snow in light? I have a color wheel. What's interesting about this is, this whole painting is bluish. The snow in light, and this is sunlight. Sunlight being, is always a warm light. No matter what time of day it is, sunlight is a warm light as compared to the blue atmosphere. I would put this blue uh, sorry, I would put this snow in light, which is bluish, I would put it like maybe here, a very gray blue. Now, if we were only looking at that one blue color, you might say, oh, that's a cold color, it's blue. Well, be careful, because you need two colors to make a judgment. Remember, color can only be talked about in movement. You can never take one color and say if it's warm or cool. Color is a chameleon. It can, it can be cool in one painting and warm in another painting. For example, this, paint, this color here, may be cool if you look at it, but compared to the blue in, sh in the shadow of the snow, so here's the light of the snow, I would put the shadow of the snow about here. So we still have a warmer blue versus a colder blue. This is how we can get very sophisticated with something like a warm blue. Remember my uh, second grade color theory, I, I said that the cold colors are here and the warm colors are here. Okay, 
but there's more to it because with gray, which is the secret of color, we can have a warm blue compared with a colder blue. I should say warmer blue, cooler blue, right? However, in this painting, if you were to take this blue and put it in this painting, in the light, it wouldn't work. It would be way too cold. The context is different. The type of movement he's using here, the palette, is different. We're gonna get into palettes at the end of the, of the talk. Um, so, warmer, cooler. He's just taken all, he's just modulated. It's like if anyone here plays music, you have different keys, right? You can modulate from one key to another. He's taken all of the colors from here and modulated them or moved them, shoved them all down. So the warm colors are now here and the colder colors are now out here. It's all, again, all about that, that movement. Okay, let's, uh, oh, here's a photograph, and I apologize, I don't know the name of the photographer. I, I found this on, on Google one day and I saved it. Uh, this is a very clear example of warm cool. Here's sun hitting these wheat fields. It's obviously a, a yellowish, do I have a color wheel here? Yeah, what color would you say that is? Well, probably a yellow, uh, sorry, a grayish yellow. Same as Scott Christensen's trees, somewhere in here, right? Maybe, maybe it's a bit more saturated, I don't know, somewhere here. It doesn't matter, as long as we know it's somewhere there compared to the shadow of that same material, it's the same wheat field, light versus shadow, look how much bluer it is. This is how nature works. This photograph is actually quite reminiscent of nature. I'm not a good photographer. When I take a picture, my phone just obliterates the color. When you're outside with your own eyes from life, which is, I think, the best way to study because you can see the raw material with your own eyes. We can see way more color than our, our iPhones can. Um, but this is actually quite good. We can see how much bluer that, that wheat, wheat field is. Uh, local color almost is irrelevant now because we have such different colors of the same material. So let's move forward. Okay, here's one of my paintings from, again, a while ago, but uh, I still like this one. We have a, uh, a monster in a cave. And the way I've designed the lighting of this is the, uh, sorry, is the monster is being hit by a big shaft of sunlight coming in this way. Um, this is characteristic of a lot of my earlier paintings. I, I would make the lighting very obvious, which I don't think is a bad thing. It's just a, a thing I would do to help. I would art direct the light to look like this to make my life easier as a painter. Right away, I'm, I just want to focus on the monster for this particular uh, part of the lecture. Look at the part of the monster in sunlight. It's... The sun is bullying it to be yellow, right? The, the monster is green, but if you, it's a green monster, right? We can all see that. But if you look at the monster in the light, those aren't really greens, they're yellows. Why are they yellows? Because the sun is so strong, it's bullied the greens to the yellow. In the shadow, and there's not too many colors in the light, by the way, not too many colors. There's a few different, there's some oranges and reds there and some yellows there, only a few. But look at the shadow, tons of color in the shadow. Now, one of my interests in art I love to push things. I love to caricature things. Uh, caricatures aren't just people with big ears. You can caricature color too. That's what I'm doing here. This is actually quite realistic, but I've pushed it into the realm of cartoon. Uh, that's my favorite thing, by the way, is when is cartoonists, because a good cartoonist will understand nature, how nature works, but just push it. So it feels believable but it is in the, it's, in, it's clearly my imagination. I love that mix, and I always strive to, to, to achieve that. The color in the uh, shadow of the monster, there are many different colors. See, there's even some purples there. There's some blues. There's some grayer greens. Um, there's nothing in the shadow that is nearly as warm as the light, and in the light, there's nothing in the light that's nearly as cool as the shadows. I'm keeping those two worlds separate, and I'm trying to link I'm trying to build the bridge between them, just like I was doing with my uh, uh, complementary palette at the start of this lecture. For example, if you look underneath the monster, this is where there's some warm bounce light. For example, the sun comes in, uh, strikes the ground, and bounces up uh, to the underside of the monster's belly there. You can see some, I'm getting into some of the warmer colors there, but it's, they're not as warm as that. But even in the shadow, which are generally cooler, there are still some warms. Like if you look at the shadow, those colors in the shadow are much warmer than those colors in the shadow. The shadow contains a big amount of play. As long as you, so as long as you have your warmest colors in the warm light, the way you build that bridge, the way you show that movement is in your shadows. You have such an opportunity to show a, such a broad range. So if in your, if in your light, you're playing with the warms, Remember, the sun will pin those, it'll bully those to be very warm. In the shadow, you have all this range. 
going from warm to cool, right? You have your coldest colors here, like those blues, maybe are the coldest color. But as you go down here, they warm up and they come right about here. Then the lights are here. So that, that's the movement I'm talking about. It's there in the painting. Your brain can recognize it, whether you're unconscious of it. Here's another one of my green monster paintings. It's the same thing. Uh, light hitting his belly. He's in shadow here. And I'm just, one of the things I love to do is I love to play with different types of cold colors. And this one's quite pushed. Again, we'll just focus on the monster for now. If you look at, uh, the only time gr green really shows up in the shadow is like there. By the time I'm here, I'm playing with blues and purples and uh, cooler reds, like more violety, cooler reds. He still looks like a green monster though. Uh, I've pushed it quite far. Maybe you can push it, you can push it less or push it more, whatever. Uh, it's amazing though, he still looks like a green monster. Your brain is able to collect the information in the light and the information in the shadow and arrive at the local color. So when you're painting, again, it's not really about local color. You can start there, but it's more about from your local color, how do you go warmer, how do you go cooler, and how much? Uh, Edgar Payne, this is one of my favorite paintings to study from. Uh, let me just check my time, my phone keeps shutting off, sorry. Check the time, okay, we should keep going here. I'm gonna come back to this painting. Here's a great way to practice. Uh, this involves a little more drawing. Just put spheres into photographs. Paint a sphere in the shadow, paint a sphere in the light. I have, you know, this is a white sphere. I, I recommend painting white spheres because they get, white gets all of its, uh, sorry, white gets all of its color from the light sources. So you don't have to deal with local color. White doesn't have a local color. So, you know, in the, in the sunlit part, it's more warm. And then in the shadow, it's getting those blues from the sky there, the sky coming down. It's also getting some, uh, green colors from the bounce, but you notice those greens are not, they're not greens like on the monster there, they're not those greens, they are cooler greens. They're cooler uh, by being close to gray. Uh, and I'll show you, I'm gonna show you some color models right now because I've, I've spent too long talking about this. Let's, let's look at some color models. In my mind, there are four ways you can move color from warm to cool. We have our warmest color on the left, cool on the right. This is the first way, this is the way we did it in the, uh, in the complementary palette. I don't know why it's showing up on number three first, but let's just go with it. Uh, we have our warm here, cool here. We just bridge the gap with gray. We did this with that complementary painting that we just saw. You know, from here through the gray, there. Here's another way. This way goes from warm and goes all around the saturation this way. You can do that. It's a bit candy colored, but you, that's a good, it's a good thing to have in mind. Uh, this one just goes the other way. We have a uh, warm going this way to cools. And then this one, number four, this is the best one because this is what nature does. This one will take the yellows and it won't go like, it won't go around the saturation this way or this way. It will go, I have to choose a way. So I'm gonna choose this way, but I'm not gonna go around the saturation. I'm gonna go through the gray like this. Almost imagine the gray is like a black hole and it pulls the color in and it like orbits around as it, as it goes through. So watch this. You can see that it's getting more red as we go. It's mo again, moving around the color wheel this way, but it's also getting grayer. So getting more red and grayer, maybe perfect gray there, maybe. And then it's gonna come back out toward purples and out toward blues. This chart number four is what nature uses. Nature doesn't have a palette. Nature, you know, we artists have palettes. Nature, uh, will follow something like this. As that color transi transitions from warm to cool, it's not gonna give you a candy color like that or like that, it's gonna go through the gray. A gray, I say, is the secret of color because nature uses gray. Now, I just wanna reiterate something. When you're painting, you can pick any range. These circles just say like, maybe that's your coldest color and maybe that's your warmest color or maybe that's your coldest color and that's, or sorry, that's your warmest color and that's your coldest color and you work within that range. As long as you know the range you're working within, your paintings will have the feeling of color harmony and, and they will look colorful. This painting uh, by John Singer Sargent is one of my favorites because my, I had an art director at my very first job in 2005. Uh, my art director said that this painting holds the secret of color. And at first, uh, you know, back then I was like, oh, wow, how? how? It's all the stuff I've been talking to you guys about. Uh, here I'm doing a little study with it where you take a painting you like, and this is a, another exercise you can all do. You don't have to draw anything. Just take a painting you like and try and make a chart where you chart the warm and the cool. And, and just try and bridge, basically try and do this. Sampling colors from the painting, sorry. Sampling colors from the painting, your warmest color there, in my case, and my coldest color there, and using your sampled colors from the painting, try and fill in the gap. 
you're not going to be perfect. As you can see, I've tried to, you know, I'm squeezing different colors in here, but uh, try and fill in that gap. And what I love about this, if we look at this painting, if I asked you, what color are those shadows? Well, they look blue, right? The shadows look blue. But there are so many, if you can see my, my study here, my swatch studies, there are so many different types of blue. Oops, so many different types of blue. Like that there is a very grayish blue. Uh, you know, let, let's take the most saturated blue in the painting, which looks like something, something about there, right? That looks like a pretty saturated blue. If an amateur artist were to paint that, probably they would choose a very blue color, something here. But if I sample it, it's that. Can you believe that? Why does that look blue? Because this doesn't look so blue. Like if I showed you that, that doesn't look that blue. But that does. Why? Because you're seeing it against the red. Uh, I shouldn't say red, should I? You're seeing it against the warm. That, that warm color, which is uh, in this range here, let, let's plot it about somewhere here on the color wheel, right? Versus that cooler color, which I'm plotting very gray somewhere here. The reason that looks so blue is because the difference between the, that warm and that blue, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, on the color wheel, that difference is what we see. We don't see the color. We see the difference. We see the movement. You don't need a blue, saturated blue to look blue. In fact, it's the mark of an amateur, really, who wants their colors to look cool, so they paint them very blue. Don't do that. Play with the gray. This is a bluish gray that looks blue because it's against something very far away from it. Even these shadows here, see those that I'm pointing to? Those look blue-ish, but if I sampled those, I guarantee you those would actually be probably here, like in the reds, but they look bluer because there's still, even between this red and this, there's still a movement toward cool. Uh, remember, chart number four from here, uh, the, the bottom one, chart number four, as we get colder, we pass through gray, just like in our complementary palette. As we get colder, we pass through gray. Gray is a fantastic color because it changes depending on where it's coming from. We've probably all seen a slide like this. Uh, spoiler, that gray is the same in the middle. But they look different, right? Why, it's amazing, especially you can see it on the screen, it looks so different, but it, I promise you it's the same. Why does it look so different? Well, I, I've already, I just explained it. They're coming from two different parts of the color wheel. This gray is uh, coming from, uh, I don't have a color wheel. That gray would be coming from the yellows. That gray here would be coming from the yellows. Or that same gray coming from the blues, it changes. This gray, I would say, is obviously warmer than that. The same gray is cooler than that. Uh, so again, your eye doesn't perceive the color. This is proof. These colors look different, but they're the same. Your eye does not see the color. It sees the movement. Understanding color is understanding how color moves. Um, now, I have a video where I paint this, but I'm, I'm going to skip it because I'm a bit short on time. You don't even need to see it because we've already talked about the painting. Um, when I prepare these, sh these slides, I never know how long they'll actually be when I'm talking like this, uh, even though I do rehearse. Okay, m okay, this is my favorite thing. Micro movements, tiny little movements. I call them vibrations, little vibrations, right? Yellow, blue, red. Okay, you can paint yellow, blue, red perfectly like that, or you can do this. I think you should do the bottom one. That's what nature does. Now, obviously, your style might be flat colors, and then in that case, do the top one. But in if you're interested in learning from nature, you should be painting your colors like this because that still looks yellow, blue, and red. But obviously there are different colors in it. There are little vibrations, right? There, uh, I had this photogra a photograph of an apple and one of my students painted this. And, and it's a good painting. I, I said, that's great. It, it looks like light. It looks like an apple. It's got form. It's got light, dimension, all that. I feel like I, I take a bite out of it. Uh, but my critique was, as a teacher, you know, I think there's more uh, energy you can get out of this apple. So I did a paint over and it looked like that. Uh, and my student said, um, you know, I, I like what you did, but I don't, see, I don't see those colors in the photo. And I said, aha, I don't see them either. But I know that they are available to us and it will still look like an apple. It'll look like maybe a more, in my version, a, a more artistic way of rendering it. Maybe that's not the right way. It's the way I would render it. What, what am I doing here? Well, all I'm doing is this is the student one, which is perfectly fine. I took the, the red that is not really moving very much, and I just made it move. I took the red, which is probably this one, and I just started vibrating it around, making it move. Now, I want to show you some models for color vibration. 
I'll, I'll use blue instead of red. But you can use any color, though. Take this blue, and model number one is take the blue and just start vibrating, again, remember, vibrating it, vibrating it like this from different hues. So you're going to get a bit of this blue, a bit of that blue. And you're just going to do that, and you get, this is the result. Model number two is the same vibration, except we're going to go uh, this way. A bit grayer, a bit more saturated. We're going to vibrate it like that. That's the result. You get subtly different warmer versus cooler blues this way by way of saturation. Again, moving to the gray will warm up a blue. So it almost looks like there's some warms in there, doesn't it? Uh, model number three is both. You vibrate it this way and vibrate it that way. So it's kind of like you're playing with the, a cloud like this, a big circle like, like this. And you get, this is the look you get with that. You can use these at your own discretion. You can combine them in your painting, use them, use one, use two, whatever. This one is an interesting one. This one combines model number three. It uses model number three, but this is a bit tricky. You gotta be careful with this one. If you are doing this, vibrating colors this way, you're going toward the gray. Why not actually cross the bridge into the land of the warm part of the color wheel and like actually have an accent color? So the blues are doing this, and then I have this tricky little accent color which shows up in, it's obviously very soft edges, blending the color. Uh, quick tip, if you're mixing, if you're blending colors like this, use soft edges. Uh, it'll help the colors look like they're mingling. Again, I'm not sure, I can't see the screen from my view. I hope you can see this. Uh, uh, the slide maybe looks better here, I'm not sure. So that explains this, this blue color. That's not in the photograph. So why did I do it? Well, I'm doing this. I just, I just reversed the colors. If the apple is red, I'm vibrating this way. And I'm like, you know what? I'm already vibrating this way. I might as well continue and add a little accent blue, a little spice, right? That's where that, that explains that blue. Now, when you do that, you gotta be careful. You don't wanna just start putting blue spots everywhere because now it's no longer an accent. It's like if you are sprinkling salt and the salt shaker breaks and all of a sudden salt spills in your meal, you've ruined it, right? It's just a little sprinkle. Uh, I do this all the time. Here's another one of my <laughs> green monster paintings. I do this all the time. Look at this little area. This is the uh, background area here, larger. Here's a sampling of colors. It's vibrating in the blues, but what's that? That is a accent. It uh, is taking, oops, it's taking those vibrations of blue, crossing the gray into a very gray yellow, and you can see them, right? I'm pointing to them, there's little, little sprinkles. I, I, there's one there. Little sprinkles here and there. There's a little swatch of it there. This is a more realistic portrait, uh, but I'm doing the same thing. Again, I did, you don't have to do this. If I wanted this to look like a photograph, I would not do this. But I want my paintings to look different than a photo. I want to express myself with color. But I still, but this, I'm very interested in this one and having my drawing be realistic. She's drawn as if, you know, in the photo, I had a photograph of this person uh, that I was working from. But I changed the color dramatically. I'm in the light, I'm doing a color vibration model. In the shadow, I'm, do I'm doing uh, the same thing, but in the shadow, I'm doing that extra little bit of spice, that little tension, I call it a tension color, it adds a bit of tension, where the hair is like those browns, right? So I'm vibrating my color in the browns a little bit here and there, getting some cooler and warmer browns, like I'm getting some purples in there, some, some more reddish browns in there, red and purple, you know, being very close together on the color wheel, so I'm vibrating there. But then, I'm adding this little tension color, and you can see it in little bits there, little tiny, I'll go back to the, the original, little tiny bits, uh, and I really enjoy trying to push that in my paintings. Where can I put those? How many can I put in? Maybe you think this is too many. This is where taste comes in. I, I think this is cool, but, or this is nice, but you know, I wouldn't always do it like this. Maybe that's too many. It's up to you. Uh, but this is the principle I'm using. Okay, let's talk about palettes. Now, nature doesn't use palettes. Artists use palettes to organize ourselves. That's what art is, well, at least painting. It's an organization of nature. Nature is chaotic. There's a million details in this room, but if you're painting this room, you wouldn't paint every single detail. You paint, you put the details where you want the focus to be. You reorganize. The color is the same. A monochromatic palette uses just one color. Uh, this is a Ryan Church painting for a Star Wars uh, episode one. God. Anyway, uh, he's painting a, a monochromatic palette. This is a, a fiery battle scene, right? Well, oftentimes red is equated with fiery battle scenes, so sure, let's make it, is that red, orange, red, whatever that is, that warm color. But the thing about monochromatic palette is you still have warms and cools because of the gray. Um, that up here is cooler than this. This is very warm. 
This is much cooler. This is the same thing. Here's Paul Desain for painting for Lord of the Rings. Uh, monochromatic palette. This one's blue. Blue monochromatic palette. He just picked one color of blue. Uh, you see these parts here? I would say those are warmer colors and those are cooler colors. Here is a version of the painting that I just photoshopped. If, if he were only to use the same saturation of color, it would look like this, the same amount of chroma. This doesn't have color movement. This is dead. This has warm versus cool. Again, hopefully you can see it. Um, because he's using the gray. So monochromatic does not just mean the same amount of chroma every time. You're still using warm versus cool by way of the grays. An analogous palette, you just take a slice of the color wheel. Analogous means colors that are next, next door neighbors. Take a slice of the color wheel and, uh, and paint with that. So here's Norman Rockwell using an analogous palette. I'm aware of the time, a few minutes left. Uh, here's Paul Lesane for Lord of the Rings using these colors. Paul Lesane using those colors. And again, thank you. If you see these colors, imagine gray being right there. Remember, we have access to the gray like this. Back here, if gray is in the middle, we have access, all these colors can access gray. That's how you get colder colors in this palette. You can't use blue because we're only using these colors. Here, you can't use yellow because we're only using these colors. You can only use gray, but gray is enough. Gray will show you the motion, the movement toward, toward uh, you know, a gray will warm up a blue or cool down a yellow. Complementary palette, we've already talked about this. Here's Bill Cohn for A Bug's Life. Uh, color key using a monochromatic palette. I love this. That, uh, the grasshopper feels very warm right there, doesn't it? But it's very gray. If you look at it, it's not, it's certainly not as saturated as that. Those are the two colors he's using, but he's using a very gray version of this and a very saturated version of that. His, his colds are way out here and his warms are not out here, they're, they're here. It's a nice little controlled bit of movement. It's, uh, uh, Paul Desane from Lord of the Rings with a complementary palette. Split complementary is nice. Uh, you just take a complementary palette and add a neighbor to one side. So. This one, uh, Scott Christensen is adding two shadow colors. He's taking the complementary, which would be there, and he splits it. So you have two, the neighboring ones. And you still have access to this hue here. I didn't put it in, but you still have access to that. And you have access to the grays, and you have access to the yellow. There's actually a ton of color you can get with a split complementary palette. Here's the reverse. Edgar Payne using a split complementary palette, uh, but this time splitting the warms. Now, where these warms are, you can see them in the light, obviously, because again, the sun is the bully. The sun really bullies the warm colors. But in the shadow, can you see those subtle warm grays warming up the blues in the shadow? That's taking those two colors and using them here in the gray. Uh, and in the light, he's more out here. That's how he's controlling it. And then, of course, the blue, you can see that the rim of the shadow here is quite blue because the sky is able to hit it. And just an overlay of the color wheel there, just showing you you can use the grays. Let me just skip that. Uh, one last thing here. If you start saturated, remember at the beginning of this, I started gray. If you start saturated, so this color, uh, this is a bit of an error. That's not the color. You're seeing a color that's about there, okay? Very saturated. I'm going to move the color to that. Look at what it looks like. That looks gray to me. It doesn't look yellow, uh, sort of, but like it, it, uh, it should look, you know, that is a very saturated color, but against a more saturated color, it looks quite gray. So again, it's, this is another study you can do to understand movement. Here, I've taken that yellow, moved it down here, and it almost looks, I mean, it just, uh, you have to do this for yourself. It's a bit hard to describe, but the color you pick against a very saturated color often looks so different because it's, the movement uh, it changes. You should play with uh, saturation versus non-saturation. Um, feeling is, uh, Sorry, feeling, yeah. These two paintings are paintings I did as part of a color class I, I hosted. Um, the color palette is here. They both use the same palette, but uh, the, the feeling is different. The color adds the feeling, but it's not fully responsible for the feeling. The light, everything else, the drawing, the light, the direction of light, that's what helps create feel. Your color palette, you can use it. You can use the same palette for different feelings. Like a lot of people will say like, oh, red always feels this way. No. Uh, you can use the same colors to create different feels. And it's all about how you study the light. So let me just, uh, I, I have one minute left. I'll just show you some of my own studies here. I'm going to have to skip these. I'm sorry, guys. But look at the beautiful color vibrations here. You can write these names down. You can find me after the lecture if you want to look at these more. Look at this color vibration, Nathan Folks. Um, you know, warm versus cool greens. I'm just trying to show you guys some, this is a game, this Palia game from a few years ago, I think. Still in development, I'm not sure. Here's, here's how I study it, and then I'm at the end of the, I have 30 seconds left, folks. Um, this is how I study color. I go outside and paint. 
Um, these are my plain air paintings, very small. You can see my hand there, uh, you can see how small it is. And this is how I study warms and cools. Um, and you don't need epic scenes to paint. Look, this is just a street. Uh, I was in Munich in Germany. I just found the street, beautiful colors, warms of the buildings, cools you know, of the shadows. Just try and get those relationships working. A cooler shadow in the building, a warmer light. Edinburgh, um, just try and get this practice of color movement ingrained. Look how small these are. You can see my thumb here, tiny, tiny sketches. You do not need big epic drawing. You do not need a big canvas to practice color. Small canvases. The nice thing about small canvases is you can do a lot of them. That's how I talk and practice color. Thank you. Is that how I spell that? <laughs> Thank you, folks. <laughs>